Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the worship service, Midtown Church of Christ. We do welcome everyone that's watching with us on the YouTube channel as we stream live, and also every visitor that we have with us here this morning. You are honored guests if you are visiting with us, and we ask that you please take the time to grab one of the white information cards. You'll find it on the back of the pew in front of you, but please fill that out for us. We'd love to have a record of your attendance with us. Um, you can either leave that in the pew or place it in the offering plate when it comes around. Uh, if you'd like to have a personal Bible study or have any prayer requests, you can indicate that on the back of the card, um, and, and uh, we'll address that need. And if we have anyone visiting with us who would like to identify themselves with the Midtown congregation to work together with us, please seek out one of the members and make that known. Our opening song this morning is 738. If you'd like to mark that in your songbook, 738. Also at this time, if you do have a cell phone or any other electronic device, please take the time to turn that off or to put it on silent so we don't interrupt services this morning. Please refer to the Midtown Messenger for a complete list of those in need of your prayers. Uh, do want to be mindful of our brother Steve Randall and family on the loss of Steve's mother last Wednesday night, so please keep him and the family in your prayers. Uh, we do have an announcement regarding our uh, logo. Uh, we are excited to report that the men have taken the congregation's feedback into consideration and have chosen a graphic to be used on our church material. Sam Dilbeck, a faithful gospel preacher and graphic designer, has designed this graphic for us, and you will begin seeing it in different places in a few weeks. There is a sign-up sheet in the hallway or for volunteers to open and close the building. So if you're willing to help with that need, please uh, take a look at that sign-up sheet and fill that out if possible. And a reminder to everyone to please practice social distancing while here at the building. Our next service will be Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our Bible study, and we'll begin our worship service with an opening prayer by our brother Ron White. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of coming before your throne. We are thankful that you have provided for us so richly, especially in this country. And we're thankful for the abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom promised yet. We have uh, things going on in the current age that weigh on our hearts. We are concerned about the isolation of widows and widowers, perhaps especially so in these times when we want to visit the widows and encourage them. Sometimes they have to stay isolated. We pray your blessings on them. We're thankful for the ability to stream and see what's going on in the assembly. Thank you, Father in heaven, for the administration in our government that's trying to help out with the difficulties of this era. We pray that you'll bless them with wisdom. We wish to lead a tranquil and quiet life in this age, in godliness, in the hopes of reaching people who do not yet know the truth. Yet it seems like there are interferences that hamper us. And some of our citizens are becoming rather like a nation of old, bitter and hasty. So we pray for our country and for our leaders. Whereas we would greet one another with a holy kiss, at times it seems like uh, it's almost as though we must greet each other as lepers who are unclean, covering the upper lip. Strange times when we would be more personable and when the Lord asked in judgment did you visit the sick? And we find that we are having to peek through a window pane to even greet or be separated. It seems bothersome and like it's interfering with what we'd like to do. It almost seemed like the devil flew in with the virus because of the things that we have 
hampering what we would normally like to do with our personal fellowship and meals and so forth. So we especially thank you for the electronic means where we can communicate, even beyond sending of cards, and at least see people and hear people. Thank you for the members of the congregation who help keep those things in place. We pray your blessings on all of our efforts to do well, and we pray that, may we pray for the researchers who are trying to find remedies and treatments to help get us back to more normal, where we can again embrace, smile, and be seen, talk in a friendly fashion, and win more souls to you than seems easy to do with the difficulties we're encountering. We will not live in anxiousness wringing our hands, for we know you see us, you care for us, and in any event, what occurs here while well, we're now sojourners and pilgrims will seem but brevity compared to the joy that awaits us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Ron, for that prayer. Well needed. First song is 738. And if you'd like to mark that place, our invitation song will be 739. Who we'll do later on. That's a good place to mark. 738. <laughs> We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is a great I am. Large Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before. First, second, and fourth. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He died in my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He died in my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I 
shall I be moved? He given me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his The next song will be number 501, 501. <clears throat> oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, a pillion in splendor and Supper, please turn to number 408. 408. Yeah. 
Receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night when she was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you try to proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. Now, Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer as we assemble around this communion table. Father, give it thanks again for the sacrifice. Father, as we partake of this cup, which you remember of your son's precious blood, Father, we reflect back upon that time again. It's in your 
your son's name that we pray. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as another part of our worship to you, Father, we offer our thanks for all the many blessings, Father, you bless us with each and every day. We know, Father, you even give us our talents and all that we have. We pray, Father, that we give back to you cheerfully, Father, with, without any greed, Father, and pray that the monies be used to do the work, Father, and further your kingdom. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As I noted earlier, the song of encouragement will be 739. And then, then turn over to number six. Song number six. If you can, please stand for the song. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal will prevail. Me. For still our ancient Work us one, his craft and power are great, and arm with cruel hate. On earth is not his evil.
Good morning. This morning's scripture reading we read from Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 to 23. Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 to 23. Now on that day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, Attended the testimony from evening until morning. It was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So it was always a cloud, appearance of cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that the children of Israel would journey, and in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. At the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey, and the last command of the Lord they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped. And according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, and then they would journey. Whether by day or night, whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. At the command of the Lord, they remained encamped, and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. One of the great truths that is made known through the scripture is that man cannot guide his own way. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We see really from the beginning in the garden, man trying to choose his own way and walk his own paths. And the decision of the first man to choose his own path has been of great uh, effect upon mankind throughout history. Mankind still feels those effects. The book of Numbers is a book which is primarily, or the name is given, because of the numbering of the people. And we noted last week there were two numberings, one at the beginning of the book, one toward the latter of the book. The first one was a little bit more than the second one because of a plague that had just come through the camp just before the second numbering. We also noted that based on the figures that are given, 603,550 the first numbering, but that was only of men 20 years old and upward, all that were able, healthy enough to go forth under war. 
were counted. And so you had those men who were not able to go forth unto the, unto war. Those men who were of an older age, also none of the women were counted, and any who were 19 years and under. And so the figures are guesstimated to be about 4 million people in a nation at that time, a nation that had been under Egyptian bondage for uh, had been in Egypt for about 400 years as they grew into a nation from one particular family. And now being delivered by God would go through the wilderness for a period of 40 years, ultimately on the east side of the Jordan River to cross over at the leadership of Joshua. How would they get from point A to point B? They knew not the land. They knew not the boundaries and the borders of other nations. And so they needed one to guide. And we noted last week in the book of Numbers, chapter 9, beginning with verse 15 through 23, we see no less than seven particular principles that demonstrate how God guides His people from the figure of this pillar, this cloud by day, and what was like as a fire by night. Last week, noting three particulars, we noted, number one, that man needs guidance. Man needs guidance. Again, Jeremiah 10, 23, the way of man is not in himself. Second, we noted the source of guidance. Look at verse 16. So it was always the cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night. And we emphasize that it was God that was guiding them in that fire and in that cloud. This was Jehovah God. And then the standard of guidance was according to the command of the Lord. In verse 18, at the commandment of the Lord. In verse 20, at the commandment of the Lord. In verse 23, multiple times at the commandment of the Lord. They journeyed at the commandment of the Lord. They stayed. It was at the commandment of the Lord. This morning, I want us to pick up here. And I want us to consider four more particulars that demonstrate how God guides man. The first one I want us to consider this morning is this. We learn God guides by means of His appointed leader. God guides by means of His appointed leader. While it was God that was guiding Israel, there can be no doubt about that. Scripture uh, certainly bears that out. God did so through a mediator. Look at verse 23. At the, hand, at the commandment of the Lord, this is Numbers chapter 9, at the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord. Four particular times as of the Lord, of the Lord, of the Lord, of the Lord. But notice, by the hand of their mediator, Moses. By the hand of Moses. This phrase, by the hand, simply refers to the means by which God was directing His people. In Exodus chapter 35 and verse 29, the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded be made by the hand of Moses. And so God was instructing Israel by the hand of Moses. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 36. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Again, we see God is the one who is guiding, leading, commanding, instructing, but he was doing so by the hand of Moses. But now here's a question. What about when Moses is no longer on the earth? Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 14. And made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses. And so God was guiding and directing Israel by the hand of Moses. Moses had been that mediator. It was through the words of God's mouth that directed Israel, but it was Moses that God communicated His instructions and directions through. And so Moses served as a mediator between God and man. Notice in the book of Galatians chapter 3. I want to note verse 19. In the book of Galatians, we find a very interesting structure for the argument that Paul makes. The Christians in the churches of Galatia, who were not Jews but Gentiles, had been taught falsely that they must keep the law of Moses, be circumcised and keep the law. Paul sets an argument up that demonstrates this. If you are going to keep the law, the law ultimately is going to bring you back to the cross where you began to begin with. Stay at the cross. Stay with Jesus Christ and stay with the gospel. But notice here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? 
Why, are you, why do you have a desire to serve the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Notice there, here's how God delivered the law to Moses by angels to Moses in the hand of a mediator. Well, it is very similar for us today. God guides man today. God instructs. God leads. God commands. God guides with the word of, words of His mouth, which have been communicated to us by His Son. Now, I want to begin in John chapter 12 and verse 48. John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that shall judge him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I want us to read together. Deuteronomy chapter 18, I want us to begin at verse 15, and then we're going to go to verses 18 and 19. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and look first at verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, Moses the one speaking, unto him ye shall hearken. Now notice verses 18 and 19. What if I choose not to hearken to this one who is a prophet that God raises up from among the people who is going to be similar to Moses? Verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. And I will put, notice, my words. It is the words of God, my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. It's similar. God, the Lord directed, the Lord commanded at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name by my authority, I will require it of him. God, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners Spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, here we see Jesus being uh, set in contrast to Moses. But now hath He, Jesus, in comparison to Moses, now hath He obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also He, Jesus, is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15, again concerning Jesus. And for this cause He, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Therefore Paul, writing to Timothy, would say, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so God, as He directed by the means of His appointed leader, God today directs man by means of His appointed leader, His mediator, in whom He has given all authority, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 8, uh, 28, beginning with verse 18. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth earth. And so we learn God's mean, God guides by means of His appointed leader. Secondly, this morning, I want us to consider this. God's guiding presence was visibly clear for Israel. But I'm also going to suggest this. God's guiding presence was visibly clear for all those who would behold Israel. Maybe not in their lives, but in this particular instance, with this cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, it was visibly clear. Now, here's a question as we consider this thought. Is it visibly clear to everyone who observes the Midtown Church of Christ, to everyone who observes your family, to everyone who observes your life, that God is guiding and directing you by His Word? Is God's guidance visibly clear? In Numbers chapter 9 and verse 15, And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of testimony. And at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. It was visible as a cloud by day, 
When all was well, when the sun was bright, God was guiding man. James chapter 1 and verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But whenever it was dark, when it was night, God's guiding presence was visibly clear. And so we would make an application for us. In times of darkness, God is still guiding man. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 may be one of the most disheartening statements that Paul makes. But then, whenever uh, our heart would fail for Paul, we're uplifted. Paul says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Here is Paul preparing to stand before Nero. All, he said. Men forsook me. But look at verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthening and strengthened me. Numbers chapter 9 and verse 21, whether it was by day or night, the cloud was taken up. They journeyed. Friends, whether it's by day, that is when things are going our way, or by night when things aren't going our way, in times of difficulties or in times of great joy, God should be our guide. Let me suggest this also, that this cloud of day and pillar of fire by night also served as an identifying mark that God was guiding Israel to the nations around them, to others. Now, it wasn't always the case with Israel that it could be seen by the nations that God was guiding them. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 7. In fact, it wasn't always the case that Israel allowed God to guide them. They turned their back upon God. Second Chronicles 16 and verse 7. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied, watch this, on the king of Syria, who is your protector, who is your shield, who is your strength, who is your buckler? It should be Jehovah God. But you've turned to the king of Syria for protection and not relied on the Lord thy God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. And we'll see it chapter 5 and verse 13. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian. When Ephraim, when that northern kingdom saw their womb, when they saw they were hurt, when they saw as a nation they couldn't sustain themselves, did they turn to Jehovah God? No. They turned to Assyria. They were not allowing God to guide them. They had turned their back on God. Times were dark and difficult. Whenever things were great, they had turned their back on God. Now times are dark and difficult. They do not turn to God. Rather, they turn to the nations. And sent to King Jerob, yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound. And Isaiah chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. It's very graphic in its depiction that Israel had reached a point where God was not guiding them. He, they were not allowing God to guide them, nor then did the nation see that God should have been the guide. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children. That's the nation of Israel. I have nourished and brought them up. They were nothing, but I made them into a great nation. They have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the donkey his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. And so the question with this particular thought is this. Is it clear to the world? Is it clear to your coworker? that God is your guide? Is it clear to all in your household that God is the guide? Is it clear to your fellow students? Is it clear to your next door neighbor? Is it clear to the world that God is the one guiding through His Word your life? In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, we say that the Jews... The majority of the Jews in Paul's day still were not following this time the prophet that is that would be like unto Moses, Jesus. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record. I'm a witness against them. They have a zeal of God. They're very zealous people, but not according to knowledge. 
They being ignorant of the righteousness of God, that is God's righteous plan to save man, and going about to establish their own righteousness, their own plan to save themselves through the law, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. God was not their guide. So some seek to guide themselves. It's also the case that some seek others to guide them. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 warned the uh, elders from Ephesus, there will be some even of your own selves that will rise up seeking to draw away disciples after themselves. How could they do that? Notice what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. For the time will come. He, he first says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, after their own desires, shall heap to themselves teachers. They'll secure teachers who will teach to them what they want to hear. They will ask, cause Jehovah to cease from among us. That's what ancient Israel told the false prophets. And so some will seek to guide their own selves. God is not their guide. Some will seek for others to guide them. God is not their guide. For the Christian, God is to be our guide. And God's guidance should be visibly clear to all who see us. Thirdly, this morning, I want us to consider this thought. Whenever we consider God's guidance of His people in Numbers chapter 9, we learn that God's guiding presence is steadfast. Notice this phrase in verse 16. So it was always. So it was always. God's guidance is continual. It was steadfast. God describes His love and constancy to Israel as a faithful husband. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 14, I am married to you. In chapter 31 and verse 32, I was an husband unto them, saith Jehovah God. God's guiding presence is just as constant today as it has always been. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, the giving of the Great Commission. Jesus closes that out, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age or the end of the world. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, quoting from Joshua chapter 1, the Hebrews writer says concerning God, He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And it's very interesting, and I know I've mentioned this on a number of occasions. In Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 5, this phrase, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have two negatives. I will never leave thee, the first negative, nor forsake thee, the second negative, emphasizing that God is constantly. But in the Greek, I will never, 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 never leave thee. For great emphasis, five times. The negative is used, nor forsake thee. God's guidance, His guiding presence was steadfast, and God's guidance is steadfast for us today. Now, this guiding presence is not, for us today, a literal guiding presence. You come out to 101 Northampton Circle, you're not going to see today a pillar of cloud over my house. And you go look out at my vehicle, you're not going to see a pillar of cloud over my vehicle waiting for me to get into it and then follow me as I drive back to the house. And if I go to the grocery store, if I go to wherever, it's not going to be this pillar of cloud following me. And if you come out to my house at night, you're not going to see an appearance of fire by night. God's guidance is not literal in the sense as it was at that time, but God guides us through His written Word. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And the temptation, the very first temptation on record in Luke and Matthew both, Jesus responds, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We've already noted John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Therefore we see that it, God guides us by His Word. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles. John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus speaking to the apostles makes this statement, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things. He did make known all things to them and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Have you ever been at a point maybe when you were teaching someone and you couldn't call to mind a particular passage of Scripture? Or you knew, well, I, I know where it is. I, I just can't think of where it is. 
all things were brought to their remembrance. In chapter 16 and verse 13 of John, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, the, the Holy Spirit is not going to be speaking of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. From whom shall He hear it? From Jesus. And He will show you things to come. And so the Holy Spirit was guiding those apostles, but I want to make this suggestion to you, brethren, the Holy Spirit guides us today through this Word. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're not going to take time to read it in its entirety, but I do want to make this point. This is an inspiration text demonstrating that men such as Paul and the apostles were men that things were revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9 beginning. 2 Corinthians, or rather 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. We'll begin here with Paul quoting from Isaiah, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Man has no idea. He cannot even begin to imagine the great things that God has done for him because God does above and beyond what we could ask or think. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us, and we need to keep it in the context. God hath revealed them unto us. Paul is talking about inspired men. God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit, and those inspired men then preached it and revealed it to man. For the Spirit teacheth all things, or rather searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man that is in him? Somebody tell me what I'm thinking right now. It's impossibility. Unless I bridge the gap between my mind and yours with words. And so the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of, of God, and He reveals those things to man. Even so, Paul continues, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we, inspired men have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. And Paul began that chapter noting that he is not speaking the wisdom of man, but determined to preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified. We speak not the man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things, the King James says, with spiritual, or comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. We are teaching you spiritual things with spiritual words which have been revealed to us by God through the Spirit. Who's guiding? God is guiding. What means does He use? He uses His Word to guide us today. God's Word is steadfast. Psalm 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord. If you read, well, Psalm 119, so many references to the Word of God, but notice Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And that word sure means constant. It means permanent. It's a, it, is, it is a constant permanent, making wise the simple. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 Verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so we see then that God's guiding uh, presence was steadfast. Then finally, let's note this one thing. Concerning how God guides man, we learn that God's guidance provides both rest and work. That's what we learn from Numbers chapter 9 verses 18 and 19. At the commandment of the Lord, verse 18, the children of Israel journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. That means they stayed. doesn't mean they went into their tents and just laid down and do anything. They stayed in that particular place. They rested, but God's guidance also requires work. Verse 19. When the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord. That is, they did those things that God commanded. God guides us today through, His, through the words of His only begotten Son. Until such a time as that guidance is removed, we are to do what? Keep the charge of the Lord. The same as Israel did. Now, 
Whenever we think of keeping the charge of Jesus Christ or keeping the charge of God, there are two thoughts that come to mind. Number one, there is the guarding or watching. And number two, there is preserving. Think about this, first of all, and when we think of guarding and watching. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conduct and godliness? Well, we need to, to be guarding ourselves or watching. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, that is, guard or keep watch. Beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Guard it, keep a watch. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science knowledge, falsely so-called. And so there is the watching uh, when we keep the charge, but there is also preserving. That is, first of all, preserving ourselves through endurance. James chapter 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth. That term endureth, the idea is to preserve under misfortune and trials. Anyone here ever encountered misfortune and trials? What about misfortune and trials as a Christian? Paul says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And so, whenever we are keeping the charge of the Lord, we are not only being watchful, maintaining and doing the work, but we are also preserving ourselves. But we're also preserve others, perhaps at times through corrective discipline. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. Paul says, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved. And that word saved there is not talking about eternal salvation, but the term literally to preserve one who is in danger of destruction, ultimately, which would come with judgment. In the day of the Lord Jesus. But also we help to preserve others through a proper example in thinking of others over self. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 32 and 33. <clears throat> Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many. I'm not seeking anything for me, but I'm seeking for others, that they may be saved. Here again, the word the same as in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. To preserve one who is in danger of destruction, and so through a proper life, through a proper example, but then there is also preserving ourselves as well as others through the Word. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. Take heed therefore unto yourself uh, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save, watch this, thyself. If we take heed to the doctrine, the doctrine of Christ and continue therein, we will save ourselves and, and that word save, the same as 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, as well as in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, or 32 and 33. To preserve one who is in danger of destruction, to both save thyself and them that hear thee. What is our charge? Our charge is the work of the kingdom of God. As Christians being redeemed from our sins, we enjoy great rest. But as citizens of the kingdom of God, we also have a great charge to keep. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That is, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things, even as you will be observing all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you. You know... Like Israel, similarly, in a sense, we're traveling through a wilderness on our way to a promised land. Who is guiding us? Israel did not know the way. They did not know the boundaries of their enemies. They had not the strength to overcome their enemies. They had not been trained for war, neither had they implements of war. They had God as their guide and protector who is guiding us, who is protecting us, who is leading us. Are you a Christian? 
Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. This was also the commandment of the Apostle Peter. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Why did he say repent? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Why did he say repent? Luke chapter 24, we learn that repentance and remission of sins would be preached beginning at Jerusalem. And when that gospel was preached, we learned that some 3,000 were baptized and were added to the church. Have you been added to the church? Have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? Perhaps you are a Christian, a child of God, but are not living faithfully the Christian life. Could you imagine how disheartening, disappointing it would have been to have been delivered from Egyptian bondage to see the great, mighty works of God just in that deliverance of loan, not to include those things that God had done for Israel while they were in the wilderness, but then to perish in the wilderness and not make it to the land of promise. As a Christian, are you living faithfully, ready to receive that great, promise of eternal life. Do you need to respond to the Lord's invitation? If so, please come now as together we stand and sing. Closing hymn would be number seven. We'll sing one verse. Number seven. Then we'll have a prayer. Abide with me. Abide with me.
Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can assemble this Lord's Day morning to come and worship you, our Father. We pray, our Father, that our worship was acceptable, that we worship you in spirit and in truth, and that your Son was glorified. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord's church that meets here for this loving family. We realize, Father, that we are in a different time. We pray, Father, that we could all be mindful of those who are suffering, those who are in need of Christian fellowship, that we could extend a hand to them. We're mindful, Father, that the gospel is being stifled at this time. We pray, Father, if it be your will, that we can continue to focus on what we need to be doing. Our Father, we realize that Christ was perfect and we are not. We realize that we often fall short of your glory and we humbly ask your forgiveness. We thank you, Father, for the supported works. The, and we pray, Father, if it be your will, that those works can continue to prosper. And for the work at the Southwest School, and for the other preaching schools out there, Father, we pray that they will continue to prosper as well, that we can have pulpits full of the Lord's churches with sound gospel preachers. We pray, Father, as we go out about our business when we leave this building, that we will be mindful of the many blessings that we have for our families, for our jobs, for the support that we have of this loving congregation. We pray, Father, we will be ever mindful of everything you give to us. We realize, Father, that this world is not our home, and we are simply stewards of what you bless us with. And we pray, Father, that we will always be uh, putting you first in our life and that we would be best stewards that we possibly can, putting the Lord's church first. And we pray, Father, that you would help us see us through this time of this pandemic. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.